Hi, and welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and this is Austin Chadwick, and here we are joined today by Rob Myers. And uh, we're going to talk today about uh, Next Agile, um, Mob Van BDD, uh, TDD is dead, question mark, and uh, leadership and uh, technical practices. So uh, we'll have an interesting show for you, but um, I think today, first off, let's get started by having you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do and, and why and how it's related to mob programming. Awesome. Hi, I'm Rob. <laughs> I, uh, I mostly do uh, technical agile training, things like test-driven development, certified scrum developer, uh, and uh, behavior-driven development. Um, and uh, my background, I had the opportunity after about 10 years of being a, a professional programmer, I got the opportunity to work on my first extreme programming project in 1998. So, uh, and uh, from then forth was completely sold on, on these practices. Awesome, nice. right on. Okay. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's just get right into it, and we'll, we'll okay. start talking about our first topic. So um, next, agile uh, mob band BDD. Yeah, and and Austin put the funny names on there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier. Maybe reiterate. Yeah. So so uh, this has come up for me uh, recently because being an old extreme programming guy and and thinking, oh yeah, these are you know these are great practices. I sort of ask myself every once in a while, well, what's you know what's the next generation, so to speak, of, of an Agile practice. And um, one of the things I found through teaching things like uh, behavior-driven development, where at the, at the end of the course, we have people work in teams on their actual product with the product people, with the testers, with the developers, all there together. And one of the things that I've noticed oftentimes is that they end up mobbing. Mm -hmm. Mm. And uh, so, and, and once the course is over, oftentimes they will say to themselves, well, well that was, that was useful. Uh, there wasn't, there wasn't any, you know, we didn't have to play telephone tag or telephone with each other all the time. Yeah. So there's that immediate communication. And, uh, and so I started thinking, well, you know, what, is, is there anything left that, that uh, from traditional agile practices, uh, uh, like or agile frameworks like Scrum, uh, that that still needs to be there, or what gets dropped. For example, if you're mobbing, do you need to have a daily? Sure. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're doing behavior-driven development, do you need to be planning? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, depending yeah, yeah. on what else you bring in, you know, continuous sure. delivery and that sort of thing. So it's like, you know, is is there any one perfect agile practice? You you got like you know mob bond and. And that sort of thing in there. And what was the one you mentioned earlier? Uh, oh, there was Zan Pan. Zan Pan. Yeah. Zan Pan. That, that's a hashtag I discovered on on Twitter, and uh, it seemed to be really big in France. But it's extreme. It's a combination of extreme programming and Kanban. And Kanban. And so I was like, yeah, well, we pretty much technically do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you, you'd have to argue pretty hard to say that we're not doing Zan Pan. So yeah. yeah, and that was kind of an interesting. Thing. Yeah. And you're 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 doing mobbing instead of pairing, but mobbing includes pairing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, if somebody is out sick on a three person mob, then we have a pair, like <laughs> right, That's like the, you saw today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I guess I guess the the thing that that I'm wondering about in that respect, and I've been trying to you know play with this idea, and I'm going to do some sessions at a, at a conference eventually on this. Is well, do we really need to come up with the the whole structure, or do we need to identify, you know, what sort of benefits and what sort of uh, synergies, if we will, sure. in air quotes, uh, we would mm -hmm. have around particular things like you know doing mobbing and doing BDD and and, yeah. and do Kanban versus and and doing some mm. you know continuous integration or continuous delivery. Do we go that far, or do we need to just back away from that? And, you know, it just depends on the team and the product that they're building, I suppose. But, yeah. but giving people the tools to, to examine that and not have to settle for mm -hmm. one prepackaged, shrink wrapped, and you know, yeah, with the bow yeah. on top of it. Well, and everybody's at a different place. And so if you just said this is going to be an incremental journey, um, discovering where you currently are is kind of the first step in that journey, right? Because then you can say, what's that one little piece that might be the next new thing that we try and yeah. add to this, right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, and I think it ties to, uh, forgive me the name who said it, but uh, it's kind of like agile is dead, long live agility kind of thing, right? Yeah. Where, where it's, yeah. it's, 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 I think he was reacting to where someone's like, 
hey, this works for us, and they give a name to it, mob programming yeah. or Scrum or any, you know, any... Scrum Agile framework for the yeah. enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> so any set of practices, like concrete practices that prove to be helpful, and, and then they're like, oh, this worked great for me, and then they share it, and then someone else tries it out, and they, instead of taking an Agile mindset with, like, the principles in the Agile manifesto of inspecting and adapting, and, uh, and they treat it more as, like, a rule book, right? Yeah. And so it's it's like taking that unagile mindset and applying it to so to speak agile practices, right? So it's more essential than any cool practice that someone used and found useful and that you want to try out is you approach it with an agile mindset, right? Sure. Which is where, hey, this is an experiment, we're gonna try it mm. and then we're gonna iterate it and maybe we'll come up with something better than what so and so tried over at this other company, right? And so Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's so it's like names have this double edged sword, right? You give a name to something it makes it easier to talk about it, but then some people treat your definition as like the rules for that thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that agile mindset thing, and then of course there's the question of what do you mean by agile mindset, always makes me uh, think about how um, there, there's, there's, there's the theoretical or the, the abstract notion of a thing, and then there's the concrete notion of a thing. And as an engineer, one of the things that I struggled with is to convey one or the other to people who are, you know, thinking in terms of, of one versus the other. Uh, all that wrapped up to say, even though we talk about the Agile mindset, uh, one of the things that I always like to point out is that there is a practice that could kind of be the defining Agile practice, and that's the retrospective, mm. because that's where you look at the mm. way that you're building things. You know, it's not supposed to be a critique of the product or a critique of the team. It's supposed to be a critique of the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the, the thing that you don't want to drop because that's the reflection upon, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to change? It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's very empirical. Uh, and that's the agile mindset is an empirical mindset. It's a scientific, you know, science, scientific method or, or however you want to phrase it, right. uh, that's the kind of thing that you're doing with those. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. awesome. Yeah, so I think the one last thing on that is, uh, you know, we promote mob programming, but inspect and adapt and come up with something better. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. not like this is the standard and this is the way it shall be from then on forever. Well, you know, and I got to tell you, when I first heard about mob programming, I was, of course, you know, completely sold uh, on pair programming. Sure. Yeah. Completely sold on it. And when I saw mob programming, I'm like, that almost seems too excessive. But, but, but nowadays, I, th I think to myself, no, the harder the problem, yeah. the more I should be on it. Yeah. Or the more it needs to communicate, the more I should be on it. And then the question is, if the, if the whole team doesn't have to have its eyes on it, or if a pair doesn't have to have its eyes on it, is it so easy that you shouldn't even be doing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's my argument, is that, you know, if you, um, anytime that we maybe have a mob, a mob say, oh, well, maybe we should all just split up and do this all on our own. And I'm like, well, could you write a generator for that or an interpreter for a DSL that could do that work for you? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and, uh, and so that was just, that was just kind of a funny thing. Cause we, we, um, in the early days of mobbing, we were just, we never said, Hey, let's split up. And then like almost immediately after we like started growing the team, it was like, Hey, maybe we should split up now. And then, and then we realized, like, hey, it's something that should be automated, right? Like all the yeah. way through. And then I kind of, I kind of really felt like aut automation of the things that can be done by one person is is actually a, a pretty good uh, thing to at least evaluate before you go down to one person doing something. Yeah. yeah. So. How, how how big is the biggest mob? Um, that you've so seen yeah, so correctly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, <laughs> the the. The one that I've seen uh, that was most interesting at a conference was uh, one of the attendees had a um, a, uh, a key to a beta for the D-Wave quantum computer. So there are a lot of people that were like, hey, well, you know, so there, there were about 20 people in the room and everybody had like minor bits of knowledge in every, every little category. And, um, the language, I guess no one, we were writing in Python, no one at the time had any experience in Python. But and so there were a lot of people doing research and things along those lines. So so we had one person entering code in the keyboard, and then we had you know maybe five or six people all looking up stuff about Python, and then a few like two people that were basically like had been following quantum computing but never had any practical experience, 
And, um, and then everybody else was either looking something up or discussing the problem. And then we were just trying to implement something that, that basically everybody rallied around because it was interesting. Right. So, um, and that was really cool because it was like, it was, it was a genuine mob where, um, there was, there was about 20 people contributing all at once, but it was like a really hard problem. Like there was basically no experience in the room for, uh, 90% of the work that we were doing. And we were just trying to get this thing like up and running. Um, in practice, uh, I've seen kind of rotations of like seven or eight, like from like day to day, like production uh, deliveries on things that were just really com- complex or hard. Again, it's like big discovery phases. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I think from time to time, I think things go down to four or three at, at kind of like a norm of like producing quality stuff that doesn't break often. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually, yeah, when it, when it becomes like, extreme experimentation then the mobs can kind of grow unbounded in my mind that's that's kind of what i've seen and and people aren't bored because everybody's kind of going off in a different direction and then merging the ideas and going off in a different direction and merging ideas really entertaining <laughs> yeah. cool ready for the next topic yeah sure. let's move on move to done uh, that and nobody's ever asked this question before yeah <laughs> is tdd dead yeah there we go. So what do you think, Rob? Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you asking me? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, it's, and, and it's actually a question that I've asked myself in the past because obviously I'm, I'm kind of, well, I'm actually, I can pitch my book. Yeah. I'm yeah, working on a book. 2021, it's supposed to come out. There you go. If, if I actually get my button gear. We'll link it in the show notes in 2021. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can link to the Goodreads page and, yeah, yeah. and encourage me to actually get my button gear. But, right? but not in 2022, so you have to finish the book by 2021. Or oh, we'll okay. link it in the show notes. Okay. There we go. There we go. So the book is called Essential Test Driven Development. So obviously I have a little bit of a, you know, a... Um, a stake in the in the game, yeah. Yeah. but I do ask myself every once in a while, you know, well, what what is it? Is it? It's been around since extreme programming's been around right. at least, yeah. mm-hmm. which is you know nineteen ninety six ish. Right. So the same length of time that Scrum's been around. So so you have to kind of ask yourself. There's not a whole lot in the software industry that's lived that long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in in my 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 feeling is that it's still very viable and still so extremely useful mm. uh, for most things. And uh, until somebody can show me something that that is better, yeah. mm-hmm. then I don't know what, you know, and maybe quantum computers will change that, yeah. but, <laughs> but I, I still think there's a role for test-driven development, uh, uh, oh, yeah. even with the quantum computers. And, um, and so, you know, people say, well, BDD or TDD, right? Mm-hmm. Should I be doing BDD or TDD? I'm like, well, you know, actually, if you look at, the way that we teach behavior-driven development uh, at Agile for All, which is includes test-driven development as part of that process. Yeah. So behavior-driven right. development is the customer-facing, if you will, um, the the uh, the product uh, uh, um, the product description is right. there, and then test-driven development is developers building sort of an engineering specification. Uh, and those can overlap a lot, or you can push it one way or the other, depending on the team, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if your your team is very technical, or if you're building something like a, a, a library or or a, a, a you know a API API, thank you. That yeah. was the <laughs> that was the TLA I was trying to think of. <laughs> you know, then then maybe you're doing all test driven development or most test driven development. And on the other hand, if you say to yourself, well, those, you know, those scenarios in behavior driven development just covered everything that we need to know, meh, you know, you don't have to use the other thing. So it's kind of a you, you get these it's like you tools in your toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, test driven development is uh, Again, I, you know, I, I just haven't seen anything like it. I do notice that I've had, uh, in fact, just last week and the week before, I had quite a few functional programmers, good functional programmers, in my test-driven development course. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, were, they, were, they were not struggling with the notion of doing testing first at all. What they were struggling with a little bit was, uh, do they need to use mocks for things? 
Yeah. And, and my mocking <laughs> example just fell apart in their laps. They were like, well, you wouldn't even mock that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. You wouldn't even mock that. But w somewhere along the line, you have to you have to check that you're calling this third party uh, uh, function. OK, mm -hmm. so so where is that going to happen? How are you going to if you needed to test that, how would you test that? Yeah. And and it still became relevant. But it was like all of the stuff that I had added into this object oriented uh, uh, lab <laughs> yep, for them yep. to do just kind of <laughs> fell apart. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, well, that's yeah, all yeah. over there. I can test all of that independently and then test that I'm passing. You know, it's, it was it was kind of funny. So nice. it changes, but I don't think it dies. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I think it kind of spins off what we're saying earlier, which is, you know, you, it's try it out, inspect, adapt, and iterate on it, and make it better and better. And yeah. I, 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 for one, found so much value from test driven development, and I think. From what it was actually been a couple threads on Twitter recently about like oh is it dead and how come you're not doing it and that kind of thing and I feel like <laughs> to steal an analogy from uh, Bob from the Metacast uh, actually from Josh from the Metacast podcast he was saying like he was using to talk about agile agile is like a machete right you can so you can hand it to someone and they can be <laughs> untrained and say oh I'm doing agile and swing it around and cause a whole bunch oh of da goodness. damage right yeah. you know and I feel like there's this. Like when I first learned about Agile, it felt very ethereal and hard to understand. And there's this process of learning that takes a while, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, to kind of uh, develop the habits or kind of see things in that way. And I feel like there's that same kind of learning curve with test-driven development. And I think if you don't give it enough experimentation time, mm -hmm. you'll throw it away without even really understanding what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I feel like that's one aspect of it. And another uh, thing I saw on Twitter was how it's presented. Like someone was saying like, well... What I usually see developers do is they'll go to management and say, oh, should I be doing this TDD thing? And they're like, well, what is it? Well, I have to write twice as much code, <laughs> and it's code that doesn't go to production, and the manager's like, well, why would you waste no. time? Let's just <laughs> skip that. You know what I mean? Sell it. Yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that's mm -hmm. most of the reactions I've seen that are negative to test-driven development, it's, they have a partial understanding of what it is. And that's not everyone, but... That's the large majority of what I've seen. That's yeah. why even the question is raised, you know. Well, and it's, it's, it's the sort of thing, it's like any other uh, discipline. I use the word discipline very specifically to, to represent a habit that is beneficial to you and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it can take up to a month to actually get something to become a habit. Uh, and you won't do it unless you see some value for yourself. In, in that habit sure. as well. Mm -hmm. And it can take up to a month to get used to the notion and, and figure out why it's useful to you. You know, so, so what people, and it's hard. It's got an overhead. It's got twice as much code, actually more like three times as much code, right? <laughs> and, but it's very simple scripty code. You know, it's, it's, you know, you've got, you can have an elaborate object oriented or, or functional coolness, all sorts of crazy things going on in there, design patterns and yada, yada. But really when you're writing the test, it's, it's like, lockstep script given when then boom 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 you know yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's really simple code uh so but but that notion that you're doing that work it's actually work that you would already be doing it's just that you would mostly be doing it up here all you're doing and and then what's hard about it is that you're recording that you're like ah okay now i record it well if you get used to it after about a month you think about it and record it at the same time right? yeah or you discuss it and you record it at the same time. Yeah. So it really doesn't take any extra time. But it's going to take extra time until it doesn't, you know? Yeah. So um, if you were a developer that wanted to bring uh, uh, test-driven development to a leader, uh, what, would you, what would you tell them to say? Or what would, what would you have that person say to that leader to sell it, right? Because we're talking about selling it poorly. How do they sell it well? How do they sell it well? I would say you have to you have to get to the and by the way you're you're you you just moved us on which is great that's fine yeah, <laughs> yeah okay we can go they with they, in, they overlap because that's the way you know everything seems to overlap right so, yeah so that topic's from the top down this one's coming from the bottom up yeah right? so, exactly. so your question is like a developer interested in doing it's trying to pitch it. how do you yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. it with management yeah. right yeah you yeah. say I have to write twice the code and it doesn't go to production yeah no. yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well. And I have a little bit of an easy time with this. Uh, I know developers don't because they're yeah. essentially coaching up. But they, they, they need to, something terse and something simple that they can communicate the business value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the business doesn't want to know it's cool, it's fun. 
the business wants to know how what benefits they're getting out of it. Yeah. Well, you know, a reduction in defects, it's not just a reduction. So I, I talk about TDD and BDD is having three levels of uh, value. It's the immediate value that we often talk about, which is, you know, test-driven development can keep you from making the dumb little mistake that we all have made in the past. Mm -hmm. And if it catches, uh, I think Jim Shore estimates uh, that it, it catches like 12 of his own little stupid defects a day. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's 12 defects that, they're little stupid defects, you know, uh, greater than or equal to when you meant greater than or vice versa, mm -hmm. uh, but are huge defects in the production. So there's that level. And then, of course, if you've got this, if you've built this safety net of tests of one form or another, fast tests around your product, mm -hmm. then you can change your product. Yeah. Yes, and that that's kind of the that's the promise of agile, isn't it? I mean, if we if we were just going to ship the thing, version one was perfect and never make any changes to it. <laughs> none of this stuff would would even matter. Right. But no one's ever been able to do that, except maybe you know some stupid little app that that you know the Iowa mm. caucus. So uh, <laughs> I thought we might go that. Day. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt it. I felt it at the beginning of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Now I'm just we've we've yeah. dated the the whole yeah, thing. So yeah. people twenty years from now will look on this and go the what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's no such thing as an Iowa caucus. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so there's that you know that ability to change your product, and the third one is the kind of thing where you really have to have. It's really hard to convey this, uh, especially if you haven't actually experienced it for yourself, which is. Teams after about six months worth, and maybe some of your teams have experienced this, where mm -hmm. after they've got that safety net, they're trusting that safety net, they're moving fairly quickly through through their their backlog or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they're all of a sudden somebody will come up with an idea. They know the code, they or they know what the product can do. They know the team. They know what the team's able to do, and they know the market, or they know something about the you know some something comes to them, and they go, oh. Wouldn't that be cool? That's kind of a, a drastic pivot for this product, but what if it could do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and the team comes back and says, "Yeah, we can have that for you in a sprint, you know, right. in two weeks period of time." And you're like, "Wow, that's extremely valuable." Right. And I've seen that happen on my own. The 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 products that we worked on for like you know from 1998 till about 2004, which is when I started doing more training than 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 anything else. We started, uh, we were, we'd have these events that were spectacular. It was like opening up a whole new market with just a, a, a week's worth of changes. Yeah. Like, and that kind of thing that we would have otherwise said, nah. you yeah. know, we would have been now we're going to have to change an awful lot of code. Things are going to break. Everything's going to blow up and we'll go out of business. Right. right. That doesn't happen. Yep. Yeah. So you have to kind of trust in that. And I don't know exactly the, the right answer then. I, I, I think it just, again, it depends on the team, but I would, I would recommend that, that teams, um, you know, do a little bit of research, uh, uh, you know, read my blog, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. there we go. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a post out there that, that describes these kind of things as they happen to me, first person. Uh, uh. Every single one of them is like, wow, you know, that was that was kind of a surprise. The first one was such a surprise, it was like, that'll never happen again in my career. No, there's, yeah. no, there's no way that happen again. Yeah. But then it happens somewhat consistency. So yeah. those are the three levels for me. Yeah. Uh, and then conveying that, that information to them that might be enough. Yeah. yeah. I like what you said about uh, uh, habits earlier, but like, you know, it, it's a lot of the companies like, are like, oh, well, you know, they they have success with it or, or something along those lines, but maybe, like, I don't think we will. It's kind of something where it's like, you see somebody who's fit and you're like, oh, well, I wish I were that fit, right? But you, you don't say like, oh, that person has really good habits, right? And so, yeah. right? Yes. Like, yeah. it's, it's all their genetics, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you blame, blame other things. Like, yeah, it's, it's the culture of the company or something else, right? But well, I get, my, my developers won't do that. Yeah, yeah. And and then I talk to the developers and they're like, well, our manager, our leadership won't let us do it. Yeah, yeah. everybody, everybody. Have you talked to each other? Story. Have you met? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, the other guy. It's yeah. the you know finger pointing. <sighs> yeah, yeah. And I think for me, two things come to mind. One, I second a lot of what you said. You know, you talk about agility, and I think it was, I think it was an extreme programming conference, maybe early on, and they were posed. The panel was posed a question: If you had to delete one thing, the product code or the test code, what would you delete? And the panel decided they delete the product code. 
because the scenario was a product you'd have to maintain for a while and the tests would tell them how to rebuild yeah. a product and then make them able to change quickly again right and so oh, that's a that's great yeah and so yeah. uh I think the ability to change, and then you can talk economics, right, and statistics, like yeah. defects, how much do defects cost, and that kind of thing. And so David Bernstein's book is one that comes to mind. Uh, I can put the book in the show notes that talks, walks through some of the statistics and the scenarios and that kind of stuff. And your book, Upcoming, you know? yeah, yeah, <laughs> might, might talk about that stuff too. Hopefully, but, um, the other thing, part of me is, and I think this is from F Martin Fowler or Uncle Bob, but it's almost like if you're a developer and you want to do it, yeah. do you need to pitch it to management? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just start Ooh. doing it? And it's just, hey, this refactoring and writing tests is part of being a professional. You know what I mean? Like yeah. when I fit, when a plumber comes and fix my pipe, he doesn't ask me, hey, is it okay if I do a good job? Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, you know. Sometimes they'll ask those kind of questions, but usually it's like, <laughs> I expect them to do a good job on right. what we paid them for, It'll right? Cost you and a so, bit more, but... you know, just start writing tests. Yeah, I'm a craftsperson. Um, well, yeah, yeah, and here's one. And, and, and then maybe it'll be noticed, hey, there's all these tests running, why, and then it'll come up, but have it come up naturally, right? And then you already have an experiment running. This is a little dark, maybe, dark TDD, but... There's a, there's, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but... Oh, please, uh, yeah. There's a little bit of an issue with that, in that if, please, you're, yeah. if you're the only person on us, on a, even a small team, yeah. who's doing the test-driven development, you're basically working on a safety net for, for part of the code yeah, yeah, yeah and anytime anybody works over on the other part they fall to their death right yeah. so, I, I, I knew a person who actually wouldn't commit any of the tests and so they, they weren't allowed to write tests but they wrote tests anyway but they didn't tell anybody they were doing tests mm -hmm. and it only existed on their machine yeah brutal i've had to do that i had to do that once and it it you know since they had partitioned the application so that each person was working on their own little area of yeah. the code it was fine mm -hmm. uh and uh and then of course they went into the test phase and wondered why i went on vacation so. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah i already know it and the only know. reason why i bring it up is some people make the bar to entry to try it out that yeah. has to go up five levels of management and that the ceo says yes i bless your ability to do tdd you know what i mean when, and is there ways you can experiment safely <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. without having to justify it you know, yeah. to some someone in your company, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you, you're, you're right. I mean, especially if the team or a small team or a small mob said, let's let's try this out. Yeah, you know? yeah. What's the, we're working towards the benefit of the product. We know we're, and, and like you said, professionalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are these are professional practices, which goes back to our topic, there, or, or the, the thought that I had with our topic, which which is, these are these are practices that that you know you're hiring professional software developers to do professional software development. So you kind of have to trust them to know how to do that. Yep. Yeah. You know, and and so if they say we're we're going to do TDD, well, you know, that's there's there's a place for that. There's, yeah. And um, and the metaphor that I often use is that of um, uh, like a sous chef. Mm. Yeah. So if you ever watch any of these, you know, uh, unfortunately they don't usually show the chefs sharpening their knives, but that's a, that was at one time, now there's an electronic thing that'll do yeah. it for you. But, but in the day, you know, in the olden days, yeah. um, you had to sharpen your own chef's knives and, and chefs would take, take it as a matter of pride that they would sharpen their own knives. And you can imagine that if a chef was sitting there like saying, oh, well, you know, I'm such under such time pressure and having to cut these carrots for these 30 people that mm. I'm preparing stuff for. And I've got a dull knife, but oh, well, you know, I'm under a time crunch. <laughs> What's got, yeah, it's, sh, sh, and they're going to come up with, you know, uh, different chunks that are going to cook at different uh, speeds and uh, probably a little bit of blood. And it's just <laughs> not it's just not going to be pleasant. Yeah. Take the time to sharpen the knife. Yeah. and do the job professionally it's safer yeah. right it's you know more precise and uh it's going to taste better yeah i get the feeling that if your organization's letting you do mob programming they'll probably let you do <laughs> <That's right. laughs> do you think <laughs> <laughs> and if not then that might also be true in the other direction yeah um but yeah i mean it's definitely um you know the the benefits of communicating through tests and things along those lines have also been a really big thing, and uh, and so I've I've witnessed those kind of three hundred and sixty quality gains where it goes from bugs all the time to 
um, barely anybody stepping on each other at all because these tests exist and can and as a layer of communication. So I always love the idea of tests as communication, nice communication format. And, right on. Um, but yeah. yeah, so we're almost at our time box, but maybe to hit the last topic from the other end, just fairly quickly is, uh, what are some things to do as a leader? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of have like a coach in the room, we have a developer in the room, and a leader, right? So, uh, <laughs> official leadership position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what are things to do from a leadership position to help instill practices that you believe would be good for them to try out or something like that? Yeah. What, what would the coach recommend? Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough one because you're in the room and you're you're like an enlightened leader. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, let your, you let your teams do mob yeah, programming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, boy, I would... <laughs> Yeah, I would say let them, well, here's the other thing uh, about go, kind of looping this back to, you know, what does your Agile look like, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a time box, one of the great advantages of time boxes is that you can run an experiment. Yeah. And then at the end of the time box, you can go, well, how did that go? Yeah. yeah. Right. Do test driven development for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Do pairing, do mobbing. Do whatever for yeah. two weeks. What's going to happen? You know, the worst case is that you don't get anything done for two weeks. Yeah. But that's not getting anything done for two weeks out of what? Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and you learn something, right? And that, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's like, you know, just to kind of answer the question more directly, I think, uh, for, from my, my perspective is the, um, you know, so... In, in many kind of traditional top-down management, it, it really is like a big difference between theory X and theory Y style management. Process. Put in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so you can look at that, and we'll probably make an episode of that at some point. Um, but uh, the you know so so you know your team's competitive advantage is is related to you know your team's ability to kind of process new information and, and pivot and things along those lines, right? And so if you look at like lean startup type stuff or or the joining type stuff where it's it's your competitive advantage is like le your learning ability your and your ability to change direction which is fundamentally agility um and so so leaders out there i think you know um try you know the whole uh, the book turn the ship around talks about like servant leadership as well so this idea of like servant leadership um focusing on your team's learning and and trusting your teams to execute on the right thing um can can then you know, foster that theory why style, um, uh, kind of intrinsic motivation stuff. Um, and so I think that's what I would recommend to a new leader to go down that direction rather than going to mm. kind of like the, um, sociopathic type management styles. Um, Curious. and, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so, and psychological mm. safety and things like that. Right. So kind of a lot of stuff that we talk about on the show. Um, but yeah, so, so as far as leadership and, and agility goes, a lot of it is like making sure that um, the intelligent people are empowered or, or have the power to, to make the decisions for things like test driven development, right? It's like the team can decide whether or not to do it and experientially over time they will experiment towards and find the right thing that makes your, your team perf outperform your competitors and without with being rigid on that just makes makes you slow to respond to a disruptive innovation in your processes for another company yeah so i mean correct me if i'm summarizing this wrong but it's kind of a epiphany for me a little bit is like as a leader you focus on the muscle for the ability to experiment mm -hmm. inspect and adapt the ability to learn and once you have that rolling basically the teams can discover their own and just watching you work i think you do focus on that for the teams, but then you'll come by and drop hints, right? And I think <laughs> uh, you, you don't demand it, right? You don't yeah, say, yeah. like, I command you as your leader. You are doing this You don't have to do this, but I have a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, I have a yeah, suggestion for you, for right? You know, and, and I think uh, you'll see some people like, oh, no, we're not going to try that. And then some people are like, oh, I'm going to go experiment with that. And, yeah. then, and then you'll see the practice grow or not grow. But just dropping seeds and giving them the ability to learn what you suggest mm -hmm. and try it out you know I can, them I can see that. I can see Chris going around to the to the mobs and doing the the turn the ship around kind of thing so what do you think I'm thinking yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what do you suppose I'm concerned about right yeah now? <laughs> yeah so uh, with that I guess we're at our time box uh, is there anything you'd like to end with Rob or plug uh, before uh, we close it out 
I just wanted to uh, ask, Chris, uh, if you recall how long Theory Y has been around. Oh, Ooh, my gosh. That's like, I don't remember 60? either. But 60? That's what I kind of think, too. I, I feel like it's Deming era. Yeah. 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 So these things, these ideas that yeah. Theory X is dead. Yeah. TDD is not dead. Theory X should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, you know, um, so, so people approach things from different styles and everything along those lines and and theory x was invented to like to solve a perceived problem and um and so it, it might be viewed as a stepping stone for society in some way mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah i mean there's definitely like you know if you took the logical extrapolation of like having to watch people do work that they get bored by and naturally don't want to do i don't think software development is in that category it's a creative pursuit and people that love doing software development love automating things will want to do it more if they're happy doing it and that's why i think theory y works so well in this environment and yeah, maybe there's a, a mesh of kinephrine and uh, theory x theory y yeah right? yeah like mm -hmm. you know in certain parts of the kinephrine framework where it's more complex or so leaning towards chaos X is going to be problematic, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, We're maybe yeah. in the very simple space. Maybe. Right. Maybe it's not right. dead. You yeah. know, Theory X is yeah. dead, you know, but yeah. I don't know. Software. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, so th then if you have the logical extrapolation of, like, saying, like, everybody should have the opportunity to uh, have a creative pursuit and be funded while doing it and, and things along those lines and, and said, so, you know, automating more and all this other stuff. So, you know, um then then you have the logical extrapolation of if theory x were dead then then that means that everybody has the opportunity to pursue the things that they want to and are not in a situation where they're impoverished or hungry or you know so yeah. so really you know I'm, I'm trying to say like software development will get us to world peace and, and, and ending world hunger in some way sometime right? wow <laughs> are we that's, a bold, that's a bold statement <laughs> are we in a, so, world peace yeah yeah, yeah. We're, oh, trying, right. we're, we're working towards it we gotta start we gotta start one all, right, all right all right i'm on the bus with you yeah. all, right. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. all right nice so uh i'll ask again yeah oh Anything you'd like to plug before we end the show? <laughs> I, I, uh, I've already plugged the book. I've yeah. already told you what the name of it is, so yeah. I think I'm good. All right, right on. Thank you. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe or share with uh, anybody you think this will help. Um, and we appreciate the interaction. Come join the discussions on Twitter, on YouTube, or anything else you see us. Uh, until next time, have a good one. Bye, everybody. Adios.